The Biden administration's executive order on cybersecurity from three years ago now alerted the uninitiated to the existence of software bills of material, SBOMs. The idea is knowing all of the elements that make up a software package can help buyers better understand their cybersecurity holes. But can the SBOM also give hackers the blueprint they need? For some analysis, we turn to Endor Labs advisor and former federal cybersecurity manager, Chris Hughes. Chris, good to have you with us. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited to be here. And you've seen this from both sides now, from industry and from government. And you testified recently before the House Subcommittee on Cybersecurity, IT, and Government Innovation. Got to love those titles. And the idea that the SBOM is a kind of a two-way sluice way. Tell us more about what you feel here. Yeah, so actually it wasn't my testimony, but it was a testimony from the Committee on Oversight and Accountability. Uh, it was in a talk titled Safeguarding the Federal Software Supply Chain. And it represented, you know, folks from private industry as well as some public sector organizations, you know, focused on government and procurement and things of that nature. And, you know, one of the things that were brought up is, you know, the SBOM serving as a roadmap for an attacker. And this is actually a topic that's been brought up around SBOMs in the past by groups like NTIA, CISA, and industry that has engaged them. And, you know, you know, obviously some merit to that. If you're disclosing exactly what's in a product, it can be vulnerable. But that said, it's not as if the government is asking for vendors to publicly disclose the SBOM and post it on a website, for example, or share it out for the world to see. Uh, they're asking for it to be delivered to the government. And obviously that's going to include safeguarding it, you know, having things like access control in place and properly storing it, you know, limiting who has access to it, encrypting it at rest, you know, things of that nature. And that said, you know, the reality is that attackers seem to be doing quite well already in terms of exploiting vulnerable products. Uh, what this does is it actually you know addresses a long-standing information asymmetry between software suppliers and software consumers in this case being the federal government clarifying exactly what's in a product and what vulnerable components for example may be in a product that they're consuming and buying and purchasing and it represents the government's attempt to use their large purchasing power kind of push this systemic change across the ecosystem yeah it strikes me there are really two pieces of the s bomb that could be vulnerable one is those references to open source elements which is what most software is at least partially made of. Some of it's mostly open source and with a little bit of window dressing to make it proprietary. And therefore, if it's open source, everybody knows what's in it anyway. And then there is the proprietary part that was coded by that vendor, which might be less known, but also exploitable. So does the SBOM kind of bring together two things that might have been better left separate? Uh, not necessarily. If I'm consuming something just like uh, in the medical industry or food or anything of that nature, I need to understand what's in it entirely, not just partially what's in it. I think what this is, is, you know, is some attempt in, in terms of the industry looking to push back on this requirement because transparency can be intimidating for some. Uh, if they have a lot of vulnerable components within their product and they haven't done their due diligence around secure software development, for example, you know, that level of transparency can be a bit intimidating and it could be threatening in terms of wanting to disclose that to the customer. Uh, like you said, maybe it's largely open source just with a little bit of window dressing on it, or maybe it involves a lot of vulnerable components that we haven't addressed and we kind of just focus on speed to market and getting out there and you know getting revenue, for example. Uh, so that transparency can be intimidating. And I think, like you said, uh, we need to see what's entirely in the product, not necessarily just a portion of it, because I need to know entirely what I'm consuming. And then if something happens, I need to be able to understand, you know, where do I have this product in my ecosystem? Where am I vulnerable? You know, for example, the Cyber Safety Review Board showed that some federal agencies spent tens of thousands of hours just trying to find where they had Log4j because they didn't really understand within their ecosystem, you know, whether proprietary products, you know, open source software, things of that nature, where they have these components in the enterprise. And so we need this level of transparency and visibility. Which also points to the fact that the big breaches, whether it's Log4j or something that Microsoft puts out on Patch Tuesdays for its own proprietary software, everybody gets hit, both open source and proprietary, with some regularity. Yeah, that's spot on. I think that, honestly, there's been a bit of an overemphasis on open source software. Not that it's inherently bad. We do need to understand our consumption and use of open source software. But if you look at the past year, for example, there's been no shortage of breaches and incidents impacting some of the largest, most capable software providers, you know, the Microsofts, the Octas, and, you know, continue to name names, you know, whether it's open source components they were using or their products themselves that got hacked or breached or caused an incident of some sort, and many of which included impacting you know, several federal agencies. Uh, so the software supply chain is much bigger than just open source. It includes all products and all suppliers. We're speaking with Chris Hughes. He's chief security advisor at Endor Labs and a former federal cybersecurity practitioner in both civilian and DOD agencies. 
Therefore, what's the best way to operationalize your use of an S-bomb? You mentioned first you have to get it, and then second you have to make sure that it's protected and not just let out to the public because you have it, as you mentioned at the top. Then what? How do you make use of it in a way that really enhances cybersecurity? Yeah, I think uh, this is actually a very critical question, and this is where the testimony raised some questions that do have some merit, is you're trying to avoid this becoming a compliance checkbox exercise of, yes, I have this document, I just file it away, stuff it in a cabinet drawer somewhere, never look at it again. It has to be actually made actionable. Uh, so CISA, for example, has put out some guidance on operationalizing SBOMs, and we're seeing industry do the same, you know, organizations like uh, OWASP or the Linux Foundation, for example. So you need to take these artifacts and actually start to integrate them into your broader cybersecurity supply chain risk management program, your vulnerability management program, integrate it into activities like procurement and acquisitions. Uh, so you have to take these things, actually enrich them with vulnerability intelligence, understand you know what you're consuming, where it exists, and then how do you actually take action on that, whether it's working with suppliers to kind of get vulnerabilities addressed and remediated, or being better prepared for things like incident response, if there is another log4j, and there will be at some time, I'm sure, as well as you know integrating into things like procurement and acquisitions so that you can make more risk-informed decisions on the products you buy. It sounds like a big exercise, and cybersecurity is already a big exercise. Is this something that can be delivered as a service, say, by a vendor, a managed service vendor, to do SBOM analysis for you? It is, yeah. And anyone who's been to the large, you know, kind of uh, cybersecurity events in the past year or two, you know, RSA, Black Hat, things of that nature, you'll find no shortage of innovative software supply chain vendors, you know, being driven by venture capital and, you know, things across the ecosystem, they're providing these platforms that can take SBOMs, enrich them, you know, start to kind of provide that centralized hub for you to use across the enterprise. So there's proprietary solutions coming to the market. There's obviously some open source software solutions and platforms that can be leveraged for this purpose. And you can integrate these in things like, you know, CICD pipelines. Uh, so there's a lot of capabilities out there. It's just much like any other kind of cybersecurity initiative like Zero Trust, it's a journey. So organizations just have to make that first step, you know, kind of iterate on that and keep addressing gaps and maturing. And so far as I can tell, the government hasn't quite made the bridge between its own imposed requirement to use S-bombs, to obtain S-bombs and use them, and the efforts that it is imposing on industry to have compliance and evidence of cybersecurity good practice, the uh, nascent CMMC program. There's also new CISA guidance and so forth for the civilian side. But so far, nobody's asked industry to have S-bombs and provide proof of those S-bombs to the government. Sounds like that could be next, though. Oh, yeah, that's definitely coming. You know, if you look at the memos from Office of Management and Budget that came out of Cybersecurity Executive Order OMB 2218 and 2316, for example, those specifically call on industry to start providing self-attestation of following things like NIST Secure Software Development Framework and potentially providing S-bombs in addition to those self-attestations. But, you know, there is one uncomfortable aspect of that is in those memos, it refers to proprietary software and products, but it kind of excludes government-developed software, for example, from these same kind of requirements. It's a bit of, uh, you know, we need to eat our own dog food. And if we're going to push industry to do these kind of activities, we need to be ensuring that we're doing them as well. Because malicious actors, they're going to target everything, whether it's developed by the government and contracts, uh, you know, support or developed by proprietary software vendors. And it also builds trust with the industry when we do what we're asking them to do themselves. Yeah, safe to say that even in those instances where the government does develop its own software, and that's kind of returned, not to the degree that maybe it was in the 70s and 80s, but it's somewhat back now, that, yeah, they're also using open source plus their own coding, and it looks just like industry, and therefore, as you say, yeah, S-bomb from you folks too, and good practice. Yeah, absolutely. And also, you know, not only does it build trust, but, you know, if we're going to talk about taking these artifacts and operationalizing them, you know, making them actionable and using them to drive down risk, uh, what better way to do it than do it internally in our own development practices, our own software development activities, you know, uh, you know, kind of practice and muscle memory with, you know, producing these artifacts, integrating them into our broader cybersecurity uh, activities and programs and maturing that aspect of it so that when we do produce policy or requirements on the industry, it's kind of grounded in practical experience rather than just kind of theoreticals or, you know, what would be nice to have. We have experience with doing these things. Chris Hughes is Chief Security Advisor at Endor Labs and a former federal cybersecurity practitioner himself. I guess you were in the Air Force, you were at the GSA, anywhere else? 
Yeah, I actually spent uh, four years in the Air Force doing cybersecurity, went from there to the Navy for about four and a half years uh, at an organization called NIWIC Atlantic and doing cloud security and DevSecOps, and then went to GSA on a part of the FedRAMP team there, uh, reviewing cloud services. And I've you know been around the government uh, contracting space for quite a bit, working with both DOD and federal civilian agencies as well. All right. Well, we'll post this interview at federalnewsnetwork.com slash Federal Drive. Subscribe to the Federal Drive wherever you get your podcasts.